On today's Locked On Thunder podcast, we're going to dive into the Oklahoma City Thunder mailbag edition. All of your questions regarding Summer League and the future of the Thunder rebuild. When will they start competing again? What trades are out there to make? And so much more coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. You are Locked On Thunder. Your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast. On the Locked On Podcast Network. Your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and editor-in-chief over at thunderousintentions.com. Ryland Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, we have a mailbag episode for you. Answering all of your questions regarding the Oklahoma City Thunder from when the tank will be over to roster cuts, to trades, start bench cut with Chet, Shea, and Giddy, which is going to be very hard to answer, uh, and much more. But thank you for making Lockdown Thunder your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you. Talking Thunder basketball. Subscribe for free across all platforms so you never miss an episode. Let's dive into your questions right now. First one from Shade NYM. Do you think the Thunder will actively tank this year as they have the last couple of seasons, or uh, do you think that they'll kind of just play the season out? He says that he thinks that they'll win a healthy amount of games this year, but still probably be in the lottery. Um, look, are they going to tank and be egregious this year? I don't think so. I don't think they're going to do that now. I want to preface this with saying that's not going to be the the mode they're in from October 18th until you know, April 17th, right? That's not, that's not how they're going to operate. I will say that I, I think that they're going to, you know, play it straight up for the first few months of the season. And then at the all-star break, kind of assess where they're at. And then the trade deadline passes as well in that, in that kind of mixture of time. And then the last 10 games or so, yeah, they might try to purposely lose all 10 of the last 10 games because we saw how that can change your draft positioning. Look how it raised up the Pacers uh, in, in the in the draft lottery scheme. Now, obviously, it did not work out for the Pacers. They didn't get lottery luck, but look how it worked out for them in the sense of uh, moving them up the ladder. Uh, they, they didn't get the number one overall pick or anything, but they still were able to improve their draft pick significantly, and they end up with Benedict Matherin, who um, is a great player, and that was all thanks to going 0-10 in the last few games of the season. So I, I think that this team will sacrifice and, and will kind of – tank, if you will, for the final however many games of, of the season. But I don't think that that's going to be their mission from day one. For the majority of the season, it's going to be fun. For the majority of the season, it's going to be uh, you know exciting to watch. And for the majority of the season, you're going to see the young guys try to develop. Another reason I believe this is because when you look at this roster, by the time you whittle down this roster from – the 20 guys it's at now all the way down to 17 whenever you include the two-way slots and only, you know, 15 standard NBA deals. When you get to that kind of surface level of the roster and when you get to that kind of base of the roster, there aren't very many bad players left in the sense of tanking players. There aren't that many players who you just are interested in who just automatically have no future. Every player of these 15 NBA deals and of the two two-way contracts, every player will provide an interesting storyline worth watching, will provide a a storyline of, hey, can he be a part of what the Thunder want to build here long term? Or, yeah, maybe this maybe this experiment is over with this guy. Like, there's there's always going to be something to watch for. I, I don't think that you're going to see the whole Xavier Simpsons playing 40 minutes a night at the end of the season, right? I don't think you're going to see that kind of stuff. Now, injuries can happen, and what if they all get hurt and they have to sign new players like they did last year or whatever? As a plan, though, I think the plan is just to play the game, you know, and, and play it straight up. And then again, once you're out of it, you know, if you're out of it for the last ten games, 
then yeah, maybe you shut some guys down and uh, focus more on going 0-10 and, and improving your draft stock. So uh, I hope that that answers the question the best of, of your ability because at the end of the day, if you look at your team with 10 games to go or 12 games to go or 20 games to go, whatever your personal marker is, if you look at your team at that point and say, gosh, you know, the very best we can do is maybe squeeze into that play-in tournament, but we're probably going to be like the 11th or 12th seed and just and just miss out. If that's what you're saying, at the end of the day, what's more valuable? Playing out those 10 games and becoming the, the 12th or, or 13th seed and missing out in the play-in tournament? Or maybe even making the play-in tournament and losing the first game? Or is it more valuable to go 0-10 and improve your draft position and improve your draft lottery odds in a draft that is just beyond deep and, and is just a, and is just viewed as a historic draft class? Which one do you think would, would benefit you more in the long run? Would you sacrifice those 10 games for a greater shot at Victor or Scoot Henderson or the Thompson Twins or whoever uh, you know is, is your prospect of choice? So that's kind of the way that I look at it. I don't look at it as like, oh, ho-hum, here's another tanking season where it won't matter. No, these games are going to matter. These games are going to show growth and development. And these games are going to be worth watching all the way through the end of the season. But the motive will more so be how each guy progresses day-to-day in his own skill set and how each guy grows with the uh, with his teammates from day-to-day. Like, folks... We've hardly seen Shea and Josh Kitty play together. We're not sure what that pairing will bring. We'll not sure, we're not sure how that pairing is going to work out. They've got to take these 82 games to get on the same page. And so you get to watch for that every single night. And it might not lead to a lot of wins. Young teams typically do not win, but it'll still lead to a lot of storylines to follow. It'll still lead to a lot of um, excitement around Oklahoma City. So that's kind of where I'm at with this season. Uh, the next question comes from at 2552 underscore Luke. If the Thunder were looking to make, a big, to make a big trade for a superstar in the next two to three years, who would be in that trade package? So two or three years on the line, the Thunder are looking for a superstar. They want to go out there and get it. They want to push their chips in. Obviously, this would be a pick-centric package in two or three years. That's what you're hoping for. That's why you acquired all these picks. That's why you got in this position in the first place. So that's number one. The thing here is it's hard to guess, right, which of these players are going to be expendable, but expendable while still having trade value, right? Like, of course, you'd want to trade Ty Jerome right now, but what value would that bring you back in the long run? So I'm going to say this, and it's going to be a hard pill for a lot of Thunder fans to swallow because we all love him. I love him too. I want him to finish his career here too. But if in two to three years, this rebuild's gone according to plan, and in two or three years, you're ready for reinforcement, you're ready for a superstar, you're ready to go all in, you're ready to make that to make that push, and complete your young core with a cherry on top of the Sunday in a superstar. The only tradable contract right now that matches salary still provides value for the team that he's going to and can, can be considered expendable for OKC without, you know, trading him would not just totally nuke the, the entire core or the future or, you know, the, the contention ship of the thunder the only player that fits all those categories is Lou Dort. This contract allows you to trade him in a bigger package to a, to a team who's giving you a player that gets more money, you know, has more money returning on onto your team, match salaries that way. But it still provides another team that you're trading him to with a really good player, and it still is able to, you know, you're able to trade a really good player without just totally ending your your run. What I mean by that is, yes, Shea makes thirty-five, you know, thirty point five million dollars, you know, this season, and so he's making a big contract. And yes, you could match salaries with him for a big contract, but trading Shea for Devin Booker, right? Just hypothetically speaking, what's that really do for you if you just swap Shea for Devin Booker? You're kind of in the same spot. You already had a version of Devin Booker and Shea. We can go back and forth on who's better, but you already had your version of that. You need to couple something with Shea. So you can't give Shea away. In this idea, if you're at that point where you want a superstar and you want to put your chips in, that means that Chet Holmgren has exploded into what we think he can be. So you don't want to give him away. And then, again, if you're at this spot in the rebuild, that means that Josh Giddey has been facilitating all of this and has been helping you get to this point. So you don't want to give him away. So who's the guy that's expendable, that still makes a lot of money, but it's still not viewed as a negative asset? Lou Dort. So... 
as of right now, today, if I had to project two or three years in the future, which is very hard to do in the NBA, but if I had to project two or three years in the future, I'd say that that trade package would revolve around Lou Dort and picks and then throw in a sweetener, right? Trey Mann or whoever, right? Throw in a sweetener with Lou Dort and a boatload of picks for that superstar in two to three years. That's just kind of where I'm at. And again, that's not a slight on Lou Dort. It's just he's the only one on the team right now that fits all that criteria. And that can change. Things can change rapidly in two or three years, as we've seen in the NBA. Coming up, we'll get some more of your questions. But first, I want to tell you right now, but good friends over at rockauto.com. Rockauto.com is a family-owned business serving you auto parts online for 20 years. That's right, 20 years ago, you could have been going to rockauto.com and finding all of the parts that your car would ever need. So go there right now and do the same thing. Listen, I know nothing about cars. I don't know a single thing about cars. But I don't have to at rockauto.com. At rockauto.com, all I got to know is my make, my model, my year, and they're only going to show me car parts that are compatible with my vehicle. That way, I'm not wasting time or effort or money on parts I cannot use or parts I do not need. Check them out today, rockauto.com. Wherever you have your internet access, go to rockauto.com. Tell them Locked On sent you in the how did you hear about a Spox, and they'll know what to do from there. rockauto.com, amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Rockado.com. We are back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Rylan Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. We're answering your mailbag questions. This one comes from at AF drums, how, with how good Aaron Wiggins and Jalen Williams of Santa Clara have been playing, is there any room for Ty Jerome on the roster right now? Look, it didn't take summer league for, for this to be a conversation. Obviously they've been playing great in summer league, but I, I, I think that the Thunder have to make more tough cuts. Obviously as a Roby was the first in line of that, but yeah, Ty Jerome, uh, I think is on the chopping block and, I truly believe, now I know that we've seen Sam Presti say some things publicly that didn't end up coming true, right? The Lou Dort uh, option, the Josh Giddy only playing in Salt Lake City, whatever. But I do believe one thing that, that, that he said and Mark said, and, and I think that it's, it's good to reaffirm, competition. Competition, competition, competition in training camp. I think that that's what they're going to be focusing on. That's what they're going to be relying on. So at the end of the day, if I had to make the decision today, July 13th, on who I would want on the roster and who I would cut and who I'd, I'd shuffle around to make room, I would put Ty Jerome on the chopping block. If that was me, now I don't make those decisions, but if it was me, I think you're right. I think that Ty Jerome doesn't really have a spot here anymore in Oklahoma City. But he has the chance, though. They've given him the chance to go compete in October. They've given him the chance to go compete in training camp. So we'll see. Uh, how that all fares, but I think that you're right that, that there's not really much room for Ty Jerome, in my opinion. We're, we're going to do many roster projections down the line. We're going to do many uh, who should be cut episodes down the line, but yes, I do think that Ty Jerome is on the chopping block. Uh, at Jared Purcell, in a boxing match between Chet and Poku, who you got? I'm going to go, go with Chet here. I, I just think Chet's got that dog in him. I think that Chet can really... Uh, handle himself in a boxing match, but I don't want to see them fight. At J Joe Cool 49, how long do you see the Thunder and Sam Presti in rebuild mode? And then where does Trey Man fit into that? Um, I think that this year will be about growth, development, rebuilding, replenishing, all the words you want to use, retooling, rebuilding, whatever word you want to use. I think next offseason is one that we are going to see the Thunder actively trying to win. I think that whenever you have the new CBA in hand, you have that clean, shiny cap sheet that the Thunder always wanted. I would be stunned. I would be absolutely stunned if we're sitting here on July 14th, the year of our Lord, 2023 at that point, and we have not been granted with some just jaw-dropping move or we don't feel like this team can take that step into a playoff arrival. Not a play-in tournament, not a not a 
spunky first round team, though a playoff arrival has been the goal from Sam Presti and the Thunder, I'd be shocked if we're sitting here in a year from now and we don't feel like that's on the horizon for Oklahoma City in the next season. So that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, and that's the standard that I think that everyone should hold the Thunder to. Now, give them this year to rebuild, retool, to develop, to grow. Uh, you know, give them next offseason to put the team together. And then after that, it's time to go. It's time to get going after that. So that's kind of where I'm at. As far as Trey Mann, um, I still believe that he has a great ceiling or, or a great potential to be a sixth man of the year type of guy and somebody who truly leads your bench scoring and can lessen the load or lessen the the drop-off from your starters to your bench. I go back to it all the time. You try to learn lessons from the first era of Thunder basketball. You try to learn lessons from how they played in the playoffs. How many times did you see you know, rest KD off the floor and then all of a sudden you just can't score the basketball? All of a sudden you, 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 the dam broke and you just lost your entire 12, 15-point lead. Like, Trey Mann can start to negate some of that, I believe, as a sixth man. So that's kind of where I fit him in to the rebuild. But as we mentioned before, somebody has to be a sweetener in a deal if you want to push all in and go for that jaw-dropping move and go for um, you know that move to bring a superstar in OKC. It's a couple with Chet and Giddy and Shea and whoever you draft next year. Um, at M, uh, at M Bay M thirty seven. What would be your favorite pick next year? I, I think that you're asking like my favorite, like my range of like where I think that the top talent is in the draft because obviously everybody's favorite pick would be number one. Uh, I I, I would I would be very happy with a pick from one to six, one to seven in next year's draft. Uh, obviously, you want Scoot or Victor, but I think this draft's really deep with the Thompson twins as well, uh, Tariq in there as well. Like I, I think this draft's really deep. So uh, top seven. You know, adding a top seven pick on top of this core that you already have with still historic draft capital in the future, I, I think that that's a, a range I'd be very happy with for next year. Uh, at book I J J, Chet Holmgren will have a huge impact on this team. I think that the ceiling is the play in tournament. What do you think the ceiling is? So, yeah, again, I believe that the ceiling of this team, if everything went perfectly and if everything was according to plan, and if you sit here and say, wow, that was the best year that that team could have had, I think it's a it's, it's a playing team. I think that that's kind of where you're at. Where And again, playing can mean that you're the seventh seed, eighth seed. It doesn't have to mean that you squeeze into the tenth seed. I think that that's the ceiling. Like, like That is the, if I if I tell you to close your eyes right now and envision what's the best case scenario next year for the Thunder, that's it. Where I would push back on that is, if they don't make the playing tournament, that does not mean they didn't hit their ceiling. It could just mean that they repositioned, Right. Because if it's clear, again, at the All-Star break, you know, we're we're good. Like, we have good players, but we're like a seventh seed at best. And then you start to have the debate of what do I value long-term? What do what benefits the organization long-term? Being the seventh seed this year? Or the eighth or ninth or tenth seed? Or having the seventh best odds in the lottery this year? Then you start to do that, that mental gymnastics of which one you should rather do. So... I think that that's their ceiling. Do they want to obtain their ceiling though, or do they want to play good enough for the whole season and then, at the end, you know, shut it down and get uh, better draft odds? That, that's kind of the question mark. But yeah, that's their ceiling. And I will say, just as we say whenever we're evaluating players, it's incredibly hard to hit your ceiling. Like everything has to go right. You cannot have one mess up. You can have one. You cannot have one slump. You can have. You cannot have one injury. You cannot have one anything. So like that's their ceiling. It's gonna be hard to reach it. But if they did reach it, of course, that'd be very fun. But I agree with you. That's our absolute ceiling. Um, at Klimakufu, uh, who will the Thunder starting five be next year? Uh, so to me, you're going to lock in Shea. You're going to lock in Dort, two highest paid players. You're going to lock in Giddy. He started all last year as a rookie. He's going to start again this year. And you're going to start. And you're going to lock in Chet Holmgren because the Thunder have shown, hey, we're going to start rookies. We're going to we're going to give them and throw them right into the fire. Let them drink from the from the fire hose, so to say. So those four are just locked into me of who's going to start. Now, then to me, this fourth spot becomes not necessarily who's the best player, but who's the best fit next to Chet. And to me, that debate will be between Jeremiah Rumpson Earl and Darius Baisley. And, you know, I, I, I love what we've seen from, from Jeremiah Rumpson Earl next to Chet, uh, especially with the shooting that he provides. Um, I, I'm still not going to give up on Darius Baisley, but yeah, I, I, I would 
I would say when the dust settles, the starting five next year will be Chet, Jerry, Giddy, Dort, and Shea. Game one, October 19th, that might be basically in there, right? Because uh, of the pedigree, because of the history, because of the, you know, seniority, whatever. Uh, but yeah, when the dust settles, when we look back on that year, barring injury, I think that the most started group will be Shea, Giddy, Dort, uh, Chet, Jerry. Uh, from at Young Russ 432 what is your record prediction for next year? Obviously, very hard to do records in basketball, but they won 24 games last year, uh, a two-game improvement over the year before, five-game improvement this year. Like, it's very, very hard to improve on your win total, especially whenever you're so young. Um, yeah, I, I think that you can win five, six, seven more games than you won um, last year. And again, it just comes down to injuries, and it comes down to um you know, motive and things like that. Uh, but it, it'll be a fun year though. I, I'm really confident in that. And I'm not just saying, I think I'm really confident that this will be a very fun season uh, from at fadeaway NBA start bench cut Chet Holmgren, Shea Alexander and Josh Giddy. This is the toughest question of the mailbag at fadeaway NBA. You've outdone yourself. Any answer here is going to get me a ton of hate comments. Any answer. Um, I'm going to start SGA. I think that that's the easiest one to decide. If you're starting SGA, a guy who can score 25 points per game in the NBA, you're going to start SGA. Um, who do you bench, though? Giddy, who I think has Jason Kidd potential, or Chet Holmgren, who, after one summer league game, people call Dirk Nowitzki with defense. Like, it's tough, right? Uh, I'm going to bench Chet Holmgren because I still think he has more um, upside and cut Giddy, but this combination is so hard. That's a very good question at Fadeaway NBA. Coming up, let's talk about who's going to be some leading scorers for the team next year. Where will Mitchich be traded next year? Who's the first off the bench? And uh, can the Thunder make a title run? And when will that be coming up on today's show? But first, once here right now, we're good friends over at Bet Online, folks. Bet Online is your best spot for sports betting, gambling, and your one source for all your betting needs and sports info. But online has you covered this year with the NHL, MLB, NBA, NFL, college basketball, college football, everything you can imagine. Make sure you check them out today. BetOnline.net, BetOnline.net, BetOnline.net. They even have MMA and boxing and golf. And it's so easy, folks. Look, I'm going to type it in right now. Type in BetOnline.net. Go to my sports book. And then drop down to basketball. And you can see some summer league action. The Thunder are three and a half point favorites over the Kings today in their summer league action. So make sure you check them out as well. So go check it out, betonline.net. Go check them out, betonline.net. We are back on the Locked On podcast network and locked on thunder podcast your teams every day now the next question comes from at dalton r three one three five one nine six five i was trying to brainstorm who the second and third points per game leaders will be um tough question obviously shay's number one i mean that's you know no surprise there at all uh as far as who will be the second and third place finishers last year uh, it was Lou Dort and Josh Giddy. This year, I'm going to say it'll be Chet Holmgren in one of the two spots. And then, um, and then Josh Giddy in the third spot. I, I think it'll be Shea, Chet, and Giddy because I do believe in the in the Josh Giddy rim finishing and Josh Giddy kind of aggression uh, aggression getting to the rim. Uh, from at Hazley on Twitter, what type of return do you expect from the Mitch's trade? Look. I know it's very exciting to think about trades and I know it's very, you know, right now it's an endless possibility of what it could be, but I think that ultimately a second round pick that's unprotected or two second round picks unprotected would be a very good return for him. And if, and if Sam Presti can squeeze out anything more, that's great because while he's a great player overseas, he's made it known he will not play for Oklahoma city. He's made it known that he wants all these demands of like what his contract will be, what his role will be, things like that. He's never played in the NBA before and he won't play for OKC. So like the only way he's coming over is if you do trade him. 
So the Thunder do not have that much leverage right here you know, in this whole conversation. Uh, the leverage is, hey, we just won't trade you and you'll stay overseas. And Mitchell will go, okay, great. I've used you as a way to get a higher pay like overseas as well. So like, it doesn't really matter if, if they don't trade him because he's very happy where he's at overseas as well. So like, it doesn't really, like, there's no real way to squeeze out more assets from a team for a guy you've never seen. Now, you know, I think one of the most likely options is Denver. Could you get Bones Highland? I don't think so. Like, right? Like, you couldn't get a player. Can you get a first-round pick? I don't think so. Like, but, you know, two seconds, that'd be really good. They were really good to turn. That's kind of where I'm at with Mitchich. Um, so, at call me, call underscore me underscore kites. Uh, when do you think the Thunder will make a legit title run? 2025? Like, if you think they're going to push all in on 2023... And they push all in and they make the playoffs and maybe even win a playoff series, right? They're still going to have to go through some growing pains. Like that'll be Josh Giddy's first playoff. That'll be Chet Holmgren's first playoff. That'll be all these young guys' first playoff. Like they're going to have to learn how to play in the playoffs. So you, you, you make a huge, you know, 50 win improvement or whatever, you know, in, in the uh, 50 win season or whatever in 2023, if you really truly do go all in on a star, you make that improvement. Losing the first round, losing the second round, whatever, your first year. Second year, okay, you're, you're there. You've won the first round. You even have a tough second round exit or maybe even sneak into the Western Conference Finals, right? Who knows? And then 2025, you're trying to win a championship. You're going on that title run. So that's kind of where I've planned for this timeline in my own head, and that could, of course, be wrong. But, yeah, that's what I'd say is, is my timeline that I'm hoping the Thunder will be able to follow. Uh, at John Swanson, what do you think the tank is over next season? Uh, 2023, I should say, just to not confuse anyone. Um, and then does Victor add with the Thunder need? Yes, Victor is incredible, and he is the best prospect, you know, since LeBron, according to, like, everyone. Also, John Swanson asked, is this just a summer slump for Trey Mann, or is there more to it? Yeah, I, I think that this is just a summer slump. I, I don't think that you should worry about this at all for Trey Mann. Um, I think they're just trying, him, trying to get him to do new things and more things and, like, trying to... Uh, see him take more difficult shots and take on more of that isolation scoring. And that's just kind of how it goes. And I did open the questions to anything. So John Swanson also asked about Arch Manning and why he's not being downgraded for not going to these camps like Jackson Arnold is. Uh, I agree with you. I think that Arch Manning's overrated. Uh, he shouldn't be a perfect prospect. Now, you can debate if he should be the first overall quarter, you know, the first quarterback in these recruiting rankings or not, but he certainly should not be the perfect prospect. That, that, that's a lot of legwork for his last name. Uh, and then the last question from at a Laka. How did you become a sports journalist? Um, I want to start by saying there's no blueprint. Like that you, there's nothing that you can magically do or say or um, follow to do this. But my experience, uh, I always knew I wanted to be in sports journalists. Like this was not something that I found out late in life. I found out in third grade. I suck at sports. Like I suck at playing sports. I'm not very athletic. I want to, instead of being, you know, Kevin Durant, I want to be Dan Patrick. So like I watch Dan Patrick all the time. I consumed sports media and studied it the way that most people study the, the game of basketball or the game of whatever, uh, as well as studying the games of basketball and football and baseball. But like, I also studied sports media. Uh, so I always knew kind of what the trends were, kind of who I liked, who I didn't like, who, you know, all of those sort of things. And then it's simply just doing it. Like in high school, I was doing podcasts that, my friends made fun of and like we're getting like 10 listens somehow. And like five of them came from some country I've never heard of. Like I was doing podcasts every week, multiple times a week for nobody, but it, and they were terrible. Like if, if I, if I somehow found them, I guarantee you they'd be terrible. If you think I'm terrible now, you should have heard me back then. It was even worse. Uh, but it's just that practice. It's just that repetition of doing it. Uh, so, so practicing it, trying it, seeing if you even like it, and then going for it, right? Like now, I did do the whole, you know, journalism school, work in sports information at your university route, um, stuff like that. But the biggest thing is just get started. Anyone can get started. You know, start a podcast in your room like I did. Start a start a blog. Start whatever you're interested in. If it's podcasting, if it's, um, you know, um, blogging, writing, whatever, just start it. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's going to be bad your first few times. Like, everyone is bad their first few times. So it's going to be bad your first few times. 
Uh, also, nobody's going to care. Like, most likely your friends won't even care that you do it. Uh, nobody will click on it. Nobody will read it. Nobody will listen to it. Whatever. But it's not about who's listening or who's reading or who's, or who's doing any of that. It's just about repetition and being and getting prepared for whenever you do have an opening somewhere. And you can say, hey, you know, I've done this podcast about the Thunder for five years. You need a Thunder podcaster. How about we work something out here? And you hook on with, uh, you know, the best podcast network of all time and you run with it. So, like, that's just kind of the, the pathway. But, yeah, the, the most important thing is just to go do it. Uh, there's not really a huge blueprint or outline for any of this stuff. Uh, you just got to go do it. And if you want any more information or, or clarity or advice or whatever I can help you with, uh, just DM me. My DMs are open on Twitter um, at Rylan underscore styles at R-Y-L-A-N underscore S-T-I-L-E-S. Also, uh, drop a comment on YouTube or whatever, and I can uh, I can get with you uh, and give you whatever advice I can about this stuff. It's a lot of fun, though. I mean, it, it is truly the best job in the world, and uh, I am very, very grateful for it. And Again, it's mostly because of you guys who actually do tune in and listen and support the the channel, support uh, the podcast, support Twitter, everything. So I appreciate it. Uh, until tomorrow, whenever we recap the game against the Kings, I'm Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. And until then, be good and be good to one another.